Welcome to the Leopoldina's International Virtual Panel Series. The German National Academy of Sciences Leopoldina started this series in summer 2020 to discuss pressing issues with international partners from a scientific perspective. Today, the Leopoldina is very delighted to welcome and to cooperate with the Academy of Science of South Africa, ASAF, a long-standing partner on the African continent. We warmly welcome you to the panel, The Hidden Crisis, Mental Health in Times of COVID-19. And we look forward to an exciting discussion among the panelists and of course with you, the worldwide audience. My name is Jan Nissen and together with my colleagues here, Buya Bulani from ASAF, we warmly welcome you to this meeting and we will co-host this panel on behalf of the secretariats of the academies. Let me shortly provide you with some background information on this cooperation. As National Academies of Sciences, ASAF and Leopoldina have the mandates to represent their scientific communities internationally and to provide policymakers and the public with science-based advice. But let me also announce some very few technical details regarding the panel. As you know, we use Zoom. Below, you can find the Q&A, the question and answers feature. We will be happy to receive your questions to panelists throughout the live event, and we will have a chance to present your questions to the speakers in the second half of this coming hour. Please only use the Q&A um, channel to send us your questions. Siabuya and I will collect and present them. The regular chat feature is not available. And now I pass over to Siabuya. Uh, thank you very much, Jan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of ASAF, I would like to welcome you to this topical panel discussion. ASAF is very proud to host this webinar uh, jointly with the Leopoldina. The subject of mental health is of particular interest to both academies. This panel discussion follows an important symposium that was jointly hosted by ASAF and the Leopoldina in South Africa in 2019, which was titled Global Mental Health in an Era of Sustainable Development, Research and Policy Priorities. The, the, the proceedings of which you can find on the ASAF website, should you be interested in, what, in the discussion that took place in South Africa. Without wasting any time, I would like to uh, welcome and introduce uh, today's uh, moderator, uh, Professor Richel. Professor Richel is a psychiatrist, a clinical geneticist, and the scientific director of the Department of Genetic Epidemiology in the psychiatry at the Central Institute of Mental Health in Mayhem in Germany. Her area of research is on genetic and environmental risk factors for psychiatric diseases with a focus on effective disorders, schizophrenia, and alcohol dependence. She also investigates ethical, legal, and social implications of psychiatric genetic research. Professor Richel has been a member of the Leopoldina since 2011. Just before I hand over to Professor Richel, I would like to ask the panelists to please uh, switch on their videos and their mics. Now over to you, Professor Rachel. Hello, everybody. Hardly welcome to our um, panel, The Hidden Crisis, Mental Health in Times of COVID. Um, for the sake of time, I will directly go into the topic and start. The severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, constitute in the first place a direct threat to physical health. At the same time, the COVID-19 pandemic also endangers mental health of individuals around the globe. Already before the COVID-19 pandemic, mental health disorders such as affective disorder, anxiety, substance use disorders have ranked among the major contributors to global burden of disease. This implies the tremendous suffering of millions of affected individuals, their family and friends. Depression alone, which is the main cause of suicide, for example, affects more than 300 million people worldwide. 
Relevant risk factors for the development of mental health disorders are distress, fear, loneliness, poverty, social inequalities, and experience of violence. These risk factors have risen massively through the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as through the actions taken against it. First studies do actually report increases in depression, anxiety, and substance abuse, and the pandemic is not over yet. We should be prepared for the consequences and seek for means to act against short and long-term increases of mental health disorders. Doing so, we have to take into consideration that neither risk nor vulnerabilities are distributed equally across individuals and across countries and across continents. In this virtual panel, renowned speakers will discuss and analyze mental health in times of COVID-19 pandemic from the perspective of different countries and continents. While in Africa, the numbers are decreasing now, in Europe, the numbers are increasing again. But nevertheless, this does not mean that long lasting effect of this pandemic and of the measures taken against it do have still long lasting effect. And as I said, the pandemic is not over yet. And so I'm really pleased to welcome our renowned speakers. And I would like first to talk uh, with uh, Professor Ashraf uh, Kaji from uh, South Africa, from the University of Stellenbosch. He's a professor of psychology and one of his main focus of work has uh, been the research on mental health among persons living with HI virus and also the con uh, psychological and structural factors influencing adherence to the therapy and how to overcome the mental health problems associated with this threat. So, uh, um, Ashraf, I will call you with your first name. <laughs> um, South Africa is uh, the country on the African continent which has the highest number of reported cases. Nevertheless, as I mentioned before, numbers have uh, gone down and on September 16, the government of South Africa decided to ease the lockdown to level one. And so it seems as if the crisis may be over. Nevertheless, could you tell us after the five months of lockdown and even now, which impact has this pandemic on people's mental health in South Africa? Yes, certainly. Good morning, um, everybody. Good morning, colleagues. I do have uh, some slides which I can show. Um, I try to share the screen, um, but it says the host is uh, disabled participant screen sharing. I wonder if that could be enabled. Oh, so I can show the slides. This is this is a pity. Actually, this was all meant to be only oral presentation. So, oh, okay. Are you able to just switch to oral? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. 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 Okay. So, what I'd like to do is first uh, talk about the baseline level of uh, mental disorders, the baseline prevalence of mental disorders. And in 2009, there was a, um, an important uh, prevalence study, the South African Stress and Health Study, uh, which provided some baseline data on uh, common mental disorders in South Africa. It was a national prevalence study um, where um, the prevalence of mood disorders was just under 10%, anxiety disorders was just under 16%, and substance abuse uh, disorders around 13%. And the prevalence, the lifetime prevalence for any mental disorder in that study, uh, the, the South African Stress and Health Study, was uh, 30%. So 30% of South Africans met the diagnostic criteria for a common mental disorder as measured by the CD, the Composite International uh, Diagnostic Inventory. So that, that is the baseline data from some years ago. Uh, it's the, it's the, the most... Um, uh, cited study that was done uh, in South Africa. Um, it, th there's a, a paper in psychological medicine that has just been accepted, um, 
now uh, in the context of COVID that shows that, um, you know, this longitudinal study showed that a uh, higher uh, COVID-19 risk, perceived risk, predicted greater depressive symptoms. So the more people perceived their risk to be high, the uh, a, a greater the level of uh, depressive symptoms um, occurred. And this was especially the case among adults with histories of childhood trauma. So adults were twice as likely to experience significant depressive symptoms for every one unit increase in perceived COVID risk. Then there was also qualitative data reported in the study that was um, uh, uh, now accepted in psychological medicine that showed that experiences of anxiety and financial insecurity common, um, as well as fear of infection. So these are, are, are factors that drive uh, mental health concerns in South Africa. There was a paper published uh, in AIDS and Behavior just now, just accepted, um, that um, specifically focused on the mental health effects of people living with HIV. And as was mentioned earlier, South Africa has a very high prevalence of, of HIV infection. Um, and the kinds of, uh, of issues that the, the, the commentary paper by uh, Professor Jaska of UCT uh, that commented on was that the rekindling of trauma related to restrictions applied to specific communities under apartheid was a, was a particularly important um, issue to, to focus on. Uh, increased anxieties related to potential infection with a fatal virus, namely uh, um, COVID-19, and then associated behavioral avoidance leading to further reduced uh, access to care and medication adherence. And then uh, uh, the, the issue of domestic violence or gender-based violence resulting uh, uh, from the lockdown. So these were four um, of the issues that uh, Professor Jaska and his colleagues called attention to in the context of the South African uh, experience of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. There was another paper uh, published um, quite recently arguing that trauma associated with uh, COVID-19 will exacerbate existing mental health conditions. Um, this may be true, but uh, part of uh, um, my own perspective is that it is unclear at this point to what extent COVID-19 constitutes a trauma and what the actual index event might be. Because uh, 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 post-traumatic stress, for example, is a disorder of memory that involves recurrent distressing memories and dreams and flashbacks of the traumatic event, hypervigilance, uh, exaggerated startle response, etc. So we, we need better data to be able to, to, to show conclusively that there are post-traumatic implications uh, from trauma. So I would, I would withhold judgment and, and offer some skepticism about the extent to which COVID-19 indeed constitutes a, a psychological trauma. Uh, in the international literature, um, there was a systematic review uh, that was recently published uh, that um, uh, focused on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on mental health in the general population. And a couple of things uh, uh, emerge from this, uh, from the systematic review. That timely dissemination of accurate information related to the pandemic was associated with lower levels of anxiety, stress, and depressive symptoms in the general public. And that actively performing precautionary measures such as frequent hand washing and mask wearing and physical distancing predicted lower levels of psychological distress. Uh, during the pandemic. In this country, in South Africa, uh, our political leadership has essentially provided uh, um, opportunities for people to engage in these behaviors as much as possible through social messaging, etc. Uh, in the, in the uh, systematic review, uh, greater psychological distress among women uh, was found because they uh, presumably uh, represent a higher percentage of the workforce that may be negatively affected by COVID, for example, in the retail and service industries and, uh, and also in healthcare. And in the same uh, uh, systematic review, people under 40 years old um, were more at risk for experiencing emotional distress, presumably due to the caregiving role in families, especially women, uh, are people who provide financial and emotional support to, to children or the elderly. And, and in the South African context, and 
also in the sub-Saharan African context, the population is generally a younger than, uh, than uh, in, in countries in the global north. Uh, job loss in the systematic review and unpredictability uh, caused by the pandemic among this age group under 40s uh, was uh, found to be especially stressful. And many people in this country, in South Africa, under 40 years old, consist of students who may also experience emotional distress because of school closures, university closures, cancellation of social events, uh, a lower study efficacy um, with remote online courses, and also uneven access to, to the internet to be able to um, manage their uh, academic workload, as well as the postponement of examinations. All of these created a great deal of uncertainty. Um, in the systematic review, uh, people with chronic diseases and a history of medical and psychiatric illnesses uh, showed more symptoms of uh, anxiety and stress. And then persons with a history of mental disorders or current diagnosis of psychiatric illnesses are also generally more sensitive to external stresses such as social isolation uh, associated with the pandemic. Then uh, there was also um, found exposure to social media news relating to COVID as a cause of anxiety and stress symptoms. And frequent social media use, um, which exposes oneself to potential fake news and disinformation and the possibility of heightened anxiety. We had a fairly strictly imposed lockdown in, in South Africa, at the, certainly at the beginning, and it uh, gradually became more relaxed. But the strictly imposed stay-at-home order and the decrease in demand for services and goods uh, affected businesses and industries to uh, a very large extent, leading to unemployment and financial hardship and, um, and hunger, essentially creating the risk for developing psychological symptoms associated with economic anxiety. Our hospitality industry and tourism industries were especially hard hit. And so uh, among people working in these, uh, in these industries, there was um, a specific, uh, um, specifically high level of uh, emotional distress. Uh, there are policy level interventions that I'd, I'd like to mention before, before finishing. Uh, one is attention and assistance to vulnerable groups, such as women, people under 40, college students, and people suffering from chronic psychiatric illnesses. And the second uh, policy level intervention is proper and timely dissemination of uh, COVID-related information and validation of news reports concerning the pandemic. The third one is easily accessible uh, mental health services especially for those who are in urgent need of psychological support and for people who reside in rural areas. Remote mental health services can be uh, delivered in the form of online consultation and hotlines. And there's some fairly good evidence to show that um, uh, uh, psychology, providing psychological services uh, through, the, through technology um, can, uh, can have fairly good, um, fairly good outcomes. Uh, and then finally, monetary support. Uh, we have a large number of unemployed people living in South Africa, people who, have, uh, um, who are living under precarious uh, financial conditions. And so social grants, unemployment insurance, wage subsidies, and new employment opportunities um, might be provided to people who are experiencing financial hardship or loss of jobs owing to the pandemic. There's been talk about a basic income grant for uh, citizens in South Africa that can assist in ameliorating the financial distress associated with COVID, which of course has implications for uh, the national fiscus. So those are my, my comments um, and I, I, I can stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. This was very comprehensive and also answered a lot of questions which we'll raise later globally. So now I turn to Professor Berta Ausin. She is professor at the Faculty of Psychology at the University of Madrid, Spain. And uh, one of her major topic is the study of mental health of disadvantaged and vulnerable populations, among them homeless, disabled, elderly, and seriously ill persons. Um, Berta, now in Europe and almost in the whole world, 
Spain is the country uh, affected with the highest increase number now, uh, increase of numbers in affected. What is this doing in respect to mental health or what has this done? It was already in the beginning, very high numbers. And so we would appreciate your opinion. Good morning, uh, everyone, and thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, well, uh, to get an idea of the mental health uh, stage of the Spanish population before COVID-19, it should be noted that epidemiological studies indicate that 8.4% uh, of the individuals present a mental disorder in the last 12 months. Um, the most frequent mental health uh, disorder was a uh, major depressive episode. And uh, as you just said, Spain um, is one of the countries, so the, the one of the most affected by the pandemic when it reached Europe, uh, leading the world in the number of infected and dead people. Um, there are currently uh, more than 700,000 confirmed cases in Spain uh, today and uh, 31,000 uh, deaths, more than 31,000 deaths. As, as you all know, in Spain, a stage of emergency was declared on March 14, applying drastic quarantine measures to all citizens for almost uh, 100 days. So you, you can feel like um, how this can, has consequences on our mental health. Uh, I was the principal investigator of the psych COVID-19 study conducted by our research team at the Faculty of Psychology of the Complutense University of Madrid. And our study is uh, the first Spanish study that has evaluated the effects of the pandemic and the alarm situation on psychological health in the general population in a longitudinal way in three moments. So after two weeks of the beginning of the confinement, I, at a month and after two months with the beginning of the disconfinement and return to the new normality. So we, we evaluate uh, with a sample of uh, 3,480 uh, persons um, and we follow up uh, this sample and, and we found in the second um, time a uh, one uh, 1,041 people and uh, at the, in the third assessment, 569 people. Well, I, I want to tell you that the presence of depressive symptoms, um, anxiety and post-traumatic stress, uh, uh, stress disease was evaluated by means of a screening test. And we found that the 18.7% uh, of the samples reveal depressive, 21.6% anxiety and 15.8% uh, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. Being in the older age group, having economic stability and the belief that the adequate information has been provided about the pandemic were negatively related to the present anxiety and PTSD. However, uh, as in other uh, studies, female gender previous diagnosis of mental health problems and having symptoms associated with the virus so, or those with a close rel relative infected were associated with greater symptomatology in all three variables. The uh, depressive symptoms increased uh, significantly, significantly throughout the confinement, decreasing at the last assessment but not dropping to previous levels. In anxiety symptomatology, there are not significant change between the three evaluations, but a downward trend can be seen over time. And regarding the symptomatology of PTSD, a downward trend is also observed throughout the three evaluations with significantly lower scores between the first and, three and third assessment. So in conclusion, uh, this research shows that the pandemic has had a negative impact on our mental health, which also it has improved with the passing of the emergency, still does not seem to be at pre-crisis levels. These results underline the importance of paying greater attention to mental health. And also I would like 
to say just one sentence about the gender difference, we analyze the gender related difference in psychological impact of confinement in Spain and data show that in the first measurement, so after two weeks of confinement, women were the ones that suffered the greatest impact in all the variables studied. Uh, women suffer a greater impact from prolonged confinement also and the longitudinal results these are consistent with previous studies um, and also we analyzed the age-related difference in the psychological impact and uh, we found the older age group the from 60 to 8 years presented less depressive anxiety, anxiety and PTSD symptoms. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beta. Um, I now turn to uh, Professor Oyevusi Goreshe from the University of uh, Ibadan in Nigeria. He is Professor of Psychiatry and Director um, involved in neuroscience and substance, into, uh, sorry, substance abuse. And he's member of the WHO Collaborating Center for Research in Mental Health. Um, oh yeah, it is like that Nigeria seems to be also affected uh, third in, this, um, in the African continent, seems to be spared a little bit, given the large amount of population uh, in relation to so far um, about little more than a thousand uh, deaths of COVID-19. And also your population is quite young, more than 50% is uh, below 18 years old. So they, are they also affected by the fear to get infected by COVID when you say that it's mainly the elder generation who uh, will be severely ill by this COVID? Or what is the impact of this pandemic on uh, mental health in your country? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, well, I'm really delighted to be uh, a part of this uh, a very topical uh, roundtable discussion. I, I think this is coming at a really very good time uh, because uh, we don't really, uh, where everyone Everywhere in the in the in the world, we're still very much in the in the midst of the pandemic, and uh, in some part of Africa, we don't actually know what part of the curve we are, whether we are climbing or we are still flattening the curve or whatever. Um, I will. I think you 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 asked the question in the in the most appropriate way, setting it in the context of the demography of Nigeria. Uh, but let me start by uh, also. Uh, sketching out the uh, evolution of uh, of the pandemic in Nigeria because that's going to give a perspective about mm -hmm. what really is the uh, uh, mental health consequence or are the consequences that one can expect. Um, Nigeria had its first uh, reported case of COVID-19 or at least coronavirus infection early in February uh, 2020. And uh, by uh, February 28, we had five cases. If you compare that with what was happening in, in uh, for example, in the UK, where they had 18 cases at a time, we seem to be at about the same level with, uh, with UK. If I just use UK as an example of a place where the information is very much available here in Nigeria. As at today, uh, we have, uh, just over 58,000 uh, infected persons. And as you mentioned, uh, just over 1,000 people have died as a result of the, of the infection. And if you compare that, for example, with the UK, where they've had more than 400,000 infected uh, people, uh, at, uh, where we started about the same level in uh, February, but they have really experienced uh, what you might call a storm, a storm in, in the way that this uh, uh, pandemic has evolved in that country. But in Nigeria, it's been drip, 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 uh, coming uh, uh, slowly, at least as far as uh, the reported cases uh, is concerned. And that has implications for the way that uh, 
uh, we have responded as a country and also the way that one can anticipate the mental health consequences of uh, COVID-19 in the country. Uh, so at the beginning, for example, when, the, uh, when we had those uh, first cases, uh, there was widespread uh, fear uh, mm -hmm. about uh, infection, about what's going to happen. And there was a lot of anxiety, a lot of, uh, uh, we might even call it panic. Uh, Nigeria went into the, the, the lockdown, the first lockdown, early in April. And we had less than uh, 12, 250 cases at a time. Uh, and the government started talking about palliatives and, uh, and, 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 um, and so on. So that was the first um, pattern of response that we had. Then following that uh, were, were these uh, situations where we were now looking for solutions and explanations. And uh, so people might uh, remember there was widespread belief that maybe hydroxychloroquine might be might be the, uh, the panacea for this. And then a lot of uh, buying and stocking of uh, hydroxychloroquine a lot of panic around that. And then later on, uh, there was also uh, information about Madagascar came claiming that they have some uh, homemade cure for COVID-19. And then Nigeria also went around um, trying to procure some of, some of that from Madagascar. And a lot of misinformation and disinformation on, the, on social media, creating even more further, uh, uh, creating further panic and anxiety across the country. But as people saw the evolution of the pandemic in other countries and saw that it really was not striking, it wasn't really you know, uh, evolving the way that they had uh, uh, been afraid of, uh, things started changing. Um, and so people started sort of uh, um, saying that maybe this wasn't really a, a problem or maybe this actually was a, a hoax and that wasn't really a, an infection that uh, we, we should be worrying about. It's probably not something that uh, had anything to do with us here. And so, uh, but the government kept on uh, churning out some statistics. Um, those statistics are largely very unreliable. Even the 58,000 or so people that I said might be infected now it's based on very little testing. Uh, and so we, can't, we don't really know the extent of the problem. So to that extent, a lot of the, uh, the, the people in the country, they sort of now assume a position of denier in which people sort of assume that this is really not something that they should bother about. Um, the initial uh, mitigation strategies, of course, led to quite a lot of problems. Um, the uh, economic consequence of that, especially in the context of informal labor. Uh, people, most people here earn their uh, income on a daily basis. So to ask them to stay indoors and not come out for, to make money on a daily basis uh, was a problem. And that created a lot of difficulties and uh, uh, also anxiety and depression. And in fact, it led to some, uh, some protest uh, some skirmishing and, and uh, uh, a little bit of violence in some places. Um, of course, it soon broke down and the lockdown was lifted. Social distancing also broke down. We can, we can imagine that this might be difficult in crowded towns and cities. And the palliative that government said they were going to uh, offer uh, very uh, grossly inefficiently done and very uh, inadequate also leading to a lot of anger and resentment across uh, uh, large uh, uh, sections of the population. So we've gone from period of uncertainty, creating fear and anxiety, and uh, loss of livelihood, leading to psychological distress, depression. Uh, we don't know whether in fact, uh, 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 suicidal behaviors and all of that might also have increased because in fact, it's not, um, we don't really have new data uh, to mm -hmm. pin this down at the moment, but certainly the lockdown and quarantine led to a lot of anger and frustration uh, across the country. I think the most significant impact was really in terms of its uh, effect on mental health service. Uh, the, the lockdown led to hospitals uh, uh, operating at, uh, at a low level, uh, doctors and nurses uh, you know, sort of not being uh, provided with the uh, personal protective equipment uh, 
started um, you know, staying away and, and running um, at very low level of hospitals. So people were unable to get access to treatment. And so mental health service was consequently really grossly affected by that, uh, especially those with long-term illnesses, also unable to, uh, uh, to procure uh, no, no, uh, treatment as a result of the way that the services were being run at the time. So that is still the case now to some extent, uh, because uh, um, while the general population is uh, really in a state of denial, uh, hospitals and health workers are quite very much aware of the risk of infection. And so services are still not back to anything near normal at all. And so there's a lot of disruption in terms of provision of service to people. Uh, we don't know what the long-term effect of this might be, uh, uh, given the way that this thing is evolving in the country. Uh, I think that it might be, at least in some sections of the population, more of chronic uh, stress leading to uh, uh, depression and, and, and of course, uh, um, other, uh, other mental health consequences consequences. We think that that will be, uh, if we uh, begin to take much uh, inventory of what has happened, there will be a, a higher incidence or a higher rate of relapse among cases. Uh, not, some studies are going on at the moment, but we don't really have the data yet um, to actually be able to uh, put some figures on this. Uh, we also think that the uh, economic uh, impact will have left uh, quite some long lasting problem in terms of depression, substance abuse. Certainly uh, uh, some domestic, uh, um, uh, no, increase in domestic violence has been uh, reported. Uh, again, that will have its uh, clear effect on mental health of, uh, especially of women who are usually at the receiving end of that kind of behavior. There is also some kind of uh, situation around stigma of around people who have the condition, uh, which in fact is uh, also linked to the, the, the problem I mentioned at the, at the beginning about the fact that we really have no uh, reliable statistics because people are really quite reluctant to even be tested as a result of the stigma that is associated with uh, uh, being known to, uh, to carry the infection. Long-term effects, we are not sure at the moment, of course, we don't really know about uh, what might be the long-term effect of the, of the uh, virus on the brain. Uh, but uh, given what uh, is now being reported, uh, more um, occurrence of stroke, especially among the young, uh, one can probably expect that to be the case uh, um, going forward. And of course, associated with that would also be things around post-stroke depression and, and so on. Um, so at the moment, the, 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 the general feeling you have in the country is sort of two sections of the community. The very well, uh, the, the educated and um, very well informed are still very much conscious of the risk of this infection. Uh, the general population much, much less so and sort of carrying on as if the infection is not really uh, a reality. Uh, and I think that the distribution of effect of the, the, uh, of the mental effect of the, of the uh, virus, it's also reflecting that, uh, that uh, um, distribution in terms of awareness, more anxiety and panic and, and depression among those who are aware and less so among those who are not. I think uh, that's by be the uh, summary of the situation in Nigeria at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oye. Uh, now I turn to our last uh, speaker, that is uh, Professor Andreas Heinz from Germany. He is head of the Department of Psychiatry and Psychotherapy at the Charité University Hospital in Bern. And he is a neurobiologist, psychiatrist, and philosopher with a research focus on learning the mechanism in mental health disorder. So Andreas, uh, Germany, albeit, albeit having high numbers, or not high numbers, but um, relatively high infections, managed quite well so far. What do you think is the long and the short term outcome of this well-managed threat in Germany? 
Thank you and hello to everyone. Um, several aspects have already been addressed by the previous speakers, so I would just like to focus on some specific information from Germany. As you said, we went rather well through the pandemic so far, but we have a, a slight increase now again, so nobody knows what fall will bring. Um, we have seen in Germany, like in other countries, an increase in sick days due to depression and other mental disorders. We have a uh, insurance that covers about 3 million people in the west of Germany who reported that there's a 9% increase in sick days due to depression. And um, the Technica Krankenkasse, a large insurance in Germany, reported that now roughly 20% of all sick days are due to mental illness, which is an increase. So this could be both from stress experience. At Charité, we did an uh, online questionnaire asking subjects with and without mental disorders across the board how stressed they feel. And uh, we used a questionnaire that had previously been established in China, so we can compare countries. And in Germany, we had about a quarter of uh, probands responding, reporting stress. In China, it was 34%, so even a bit higher. And um, we also see that people who are hit by uh, the infection do suffer mentally or with their, with their mental health, particularly when they lose smell, as some patients have reported. And then they say that the food doesn't taste anymore and they're very worried if they will recover or uh, like that. We do fear that both um, social isolation and poverty following could affect not only depression ratings, but also suicide rates so far. Thank God we haven't really seen an increase, but we know from Greece and from the um, strict measures imposed during the uh, financial crisis there that suicide rates went up with joblessness and with um, increasing amounts of deaths and poverty. So we hope that we don't see that in Germany, but it's still a problem. And I would like to address one specifically vulnerable group of patients that we see in the center of Berlin here quite a lot, that is homeless people. We have an increase in patients on acute psychiatry wards that have uh, no permanent home, that live in shelters or on the road. It's up to 30% of our patients on acute wards with a, a variance in Berlin between 10 and 30%, but 30% is uh, what happens in the center here. And this is not only due to uh, patients living in Berlin for a long time losing their homes due to gentrification and increasing rents and um, legal problems when they have a mental disorder, for example, when they hear voices and shout out loud to, you know, um, blend these voices out and then they lose their, their apartments. It's also due to um, people from Europe coming to Germany because here is a uh, freedom of movement and some social aid that cannot be found in other countries. So um, particularly from neighboring countries, we also have homeless people who also face language barriers to uh, mental health treatment, which is a uh, problem in itself. So here we've seen infections, which is one problem. And the other problem is that a lot of outpatient services were closed down during the height of the infection rates. And um, persons, patients who have a, a home can also phone in or use video conferencing, but homeless patients do not have these facilities. At best, they could phone. And um, we are... Um, discussing with the insurances whether they pay phone contacts as much as video conferences. They would like to have an equivalent to personal meetings. We understand that. But we keep emphasizing that particularly for socially challenged and poorer parts of the population, the phone is often the only way to communicate with us. At this point, um, everything is mostly back to normal, but we still cannot, um, when we admit patients to the hospital, we cannot put them in uh, rooms for multiple patients. We have to keep single patient rooms. We are not really reimbursed for this anymore, so there will be some financial distress on hospitals to the end of the year, and hopefully we don't experience too much of that next year. And um, finally, we have carried out together with other societies for um, 
psychiatry associations, um, information campaigns, and try to provide information to um, caretakers on all levels of the German healthcare system. But we do see that what is kind of missing is a comprehensive account of how people cope with the situation and what socially or culturally or gender has been addressed already specific challenges are in there in this pandemic we have uh, more local data in the moment than national data but we hope that this will change soon so maybe in a nutshell that's the situation here thank you very much andreas that was very uh, cohesive and um, still stunning that there's so many yeah, a group of persons in the healthy Germany who is suffering from this crisis so much. So I would have many, many, many more questions to you, but I've seen you already answered many of them and a lot of them will remain unanswered, but we will also give our audience the possibility to ask questions. So I would just ask you if you could really in a nutshell, perhaps with in within one minute, say what do you consider the most important to fight mental health? What well, I know it's almost impossible, but what would you consider? I start with you, Andreas, because you're still <laughs> just on. What would you consider the most important to fight the uh, mental health uh, consequences of this crisis? I think the largest part is on the communities which have to solidarically support each other and then as, as professionals we can um, ask people to be generous with each other to not fight too much about interpretations of the pandemic and how dangerous this is and whether the government does this or that step correctly but just kind of um, emphasize this sense of at least during these months working together and trying to, to be tolerant towards each other and support each other. Thank you very much. Uh, Beta, what would you, your advice be? Oh, you're muted, Beta. You have to unmute. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, say, I think collaborating in the treatment and recovery of those affected in the creation of social health spaces and rethinking the, fun the functions and tasks of primary care in mental health. Mm, that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, Ashra, what would your uh, advice be? Well, I mentioned some policy issues uh, in my presentation, but there are specific individual level interventions. Uh, there are five that I can mention. Regular exercise and healthy diet. Uh, mm -hmm. Exposure to uh, COVID-related news to avoid potential false reports. Mm -hmm. um, obtaining uh, information from authorized news agencies and organizations and seeking medical advice only from properly trained healthcare professionals. Social contact with friends and family by phone calls and video calls. And then lastly, access to mental health services uh, through technology such as Zoom and Microsoft Teams and Skype, etc. Thank you very much. And Oye, your advice? Yeah, a couple of um, things that we can do. One is um, uh, information sh uh, uh, sharing. I think people need information. They need to be very well educated about this and what, uh, how, how to avoid it and what one might do to uh, uh, seek uh, assistance if one gets uh, infected or one gets any kind of a reaction or mental health problem. Secondly, I think um, in the context of the common problem that we expect, the common mental disorders, this can only be addressed if, uh, more if effectively at primary care level. So the uh, um, process of tax shifting, which is the way in which we have tried to expand service, uh, given the, 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 the scarcity of specialists in our country anyway, uh, means that we need to empower primary care providers to be able to detect and treat uh, common mental health conditions that will be consequences of, of the COVID-19. And lastly, uh, just like the last speaker mentioned, there is now an opportunity to build on this largely unexplored um, resource of telehealth, 
using all, all uh, various uh, platforms uh, uh, that might be available right, to deliver uh, uh, health to a large population. Now COVID-19 is making that inevitable, unavoidable now. And I think we should now expand and, and build on it and see to what extent this can become a more, uh, a better uh, platform for uh, delivering service. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And um, now we will uh, take the question from the audience. Jan, you will present these to us. Yes, I, I, we have uh, quite a, a number of questions, but maybe before I go to the questions, I'd like to indicate that uh, this webinar is recorded. And for many of those who are interested in knowing if uh, there's going to be a video, indeed, uh, this will be shared on various appropriate uh, platforms. So uh, there, is a, uh, there is a question uh, to all panelists. Uh, it, it goes, is there evidence of the extent of psychiatric patients not assessing treatment during lockdown as led to committal of criminal offenses? So I would uh, hand over this question to Ashraf, could you? Uh, I don't have any data uh, on, on this, and I don't know what South African data exist. I mean, just to speculate, I'm imagining there would be some, um, uh, some uh, uh, of, of what the question is, is answer, asking. Um, uh, the lack of access to mental health services um, is a fairly ubiquitous phenomenon, and there is such a thing as a mental health gap the number of people requiring treatment and the actual uh, uh, level of services that are available and the two don't match each other. And so people do make their way into the criminal justice system as a consequence because of the inability of the mental health system to cope with the number of people requiring uh, uh, treatment. Thank you. And I say, what about that? I, I don't, we, we don't have any, any uh, data on that, but I will sort of turn it around and say, in fact, what is more likely is that will be an increase in victimization rather than an uh, increase in criminality because uh, persons with mental health conditions are often more at the receiving end of violence than actually perpetuating violence. Thank you very much for pointing this out. This is very important, especially with the stigmatization of psychiatrically ill patients. Uh, do we have further questions? Yes, actually, we have uh, various uh, further questions. Um, um, there is one question for Professor Heinz. And um, the spectator asked, uh, what kind of experience do you have with obsessive, obsessive compulsive disorder patients? Did it increase? Okay, that's an interesting question. And we were in contact um, as the German Association of Psychiatry with the self help organization, the national one of OCD patients. And um, our suspicion was like the, um, question asked, do you suffer more because you're more worried about infection? And the opposite was uh, reported to us. They said that finally the Germans are starting to wash their hands orderly and uh, many OCD patients uh, feel relieved that there is some um, sense of hygiene now more widespread in the population. So this, these are the organizations, but also from patients with personal context, we haven't really experienced a big increase in fear and anxiety, rather uh, a certain normalization of hygiene concerns. Thank you. <laughs> See ya. So we do have another question directed uh, to Prof Kanji. Uh, Prof Kanji, the question is, would you comment on how the process of mourning with cultural traditions have affected the psyche of people during the pandemic, given the restrictions imposed on funeral practices and traditions in South Africa? Yes, this is a really, really important question and, and, a, and a very relevant uh, uh, matter. Um, um, attending funerals is a very important um, a component of, of the mourning process uh, for people everywhere. But I think in South Africa, funerals have played a very important role um, in, in generating social cohesion and social capital 
etc. During the apartheid era, funerals of people who were uh, 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 killed by the apartheid forces was a, a forum for activism as well. So um, not being able to attend a, a, a funeral plays a, plays a, a, a very important role in, in people's ability to mourn and grieve. Um, does it affect the psyche? We don't have data on that uh, uh, right now. Um, I think it, it will have implications for people's ability to um, engage with each other, to support each other, to provide social support and community support, um, and to be able to say their farewells and goodbyes to their loved ones who have, who have passed on. So um, in all likelihood, it, it, has, it will have implications for individuals and families and communities. At funerals, people also, um, for example, would give a little bit of money to uh, uh, the family of the deceased person to provide some kind of financial support. Not being able to attend a funeral or to travel from one province to another to attend a funeral will limit the ability for people to receive uh, some kind of uh, financial support from their community members um, as well. So, so yeah, uh, to, to, to speculate in the absence of data, uh, I think there are going to be implications for how people manage uh, their grief and, and how people manage their, their, their social interactions. Thank um, you very much. I have another question for, for Berta. And um, the spectator asked, um, are there any differences in dealing with the pandemics by, uh, psychologically between men and women? Muted. Yes, <laughs> sorry. Um, yes, there are. I, uh, one minute. I, I, I would like to see the data on our uh, last paper we, um, we published about gender. Uh, well, uh, uh, wait. The, the, uh, as I told you, the data uh, said that women were the ones that suffered the greatest impact in all the variables study and the, and the lowest level of uh, well-being. Uh, women's also uh, levels of loneliness increase. Um, well, uh, so women suffer a greater impact, as I said, and uh, one explanation for these results may be that the prevalence of depression and anxiety in generally Hell, uh, high, is higher in women, but uh, it can also indicate that they are suffering, or we are suffering from a greater <coughs> sorry, a care burden uh, due to the increased need for care, both uh, outside and inside the home during lockdown. Uh, so in addition, uh, as you know, like uh, children were 100 um, days at home and mostly women were the ones who has to take care of them and also telework. In addition, it's also um, worth noting the increase of in domestic violence that has occurred during this stage of emergency with those affected um, unable to physically move away from the aggressor and the lack of support uh, resources. So it, it has to be I said I, I answer that. Thank you. Yes, there, there is another question um, to direct it to uh, Professor Guraje. Is there mental health concerns in Nigeria linked to fear of contacting the virus or to economic issues as a result of COVID-19? And what are the general perceptions about COVID-19? Yeah, as I mentioned before, the general perception has uh, changed over time. At the beginning, uh, there was a lot of um, anxiety and fear about uh, the evolution of the, of the pandemic. Uh, but as time went by and uh, people were seeing relatively uh, few uh, small numbers compared with countries in Europe, for example, uh, the, the um, perception about it started changing and a lot of disinformation of course misinformation also started spreading around that this might not this might not be reality this might be a hoax and all of that um, so that's also um, 
that that's uh, reflected in the pattern of uh, mental health consequences. So at the beginning, a lot of anxiety uh, uh, related to the to the uh, infection. Or the, uh, later on, when there was a lockdown, um, consequence of that was uh, people were unable to earn their li a living, given the informal nature of the labor market generally, where people have to uh, get a daily income. And so that led also to a lot of anger, frustration, uh, depression, and in fact, there were um, uh, protests and, uh, and, 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 and some uh, incidents of, of uh, violence uh, until the lockdown was lifted. But at the moment now, you have that pattern that I described before, where the much more informed section of the community are still uh, very anxious and still very worried and and uh, uh, and then a larger section of the community much more in denial uh, of what's going on and so probably less likely to be anxious about this the the, the situation uh, but certainly the lingering effect of the economic problem uh, because the economic problem is not just related to the lockdown it also has to do with the fact that the economy itself is also are suffering and the price of oil went down and a lot of economic activities were affected and that has led to uh, 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 increase in the level of poverty. So uh, one can expect, we don't have data about, for example, suicidal behavior and all of that, uh, but one can expect this to be the case. What well, we have data on domestic violence that's certainly going up. That might be a result of the frustration, but it can also be a result of the lockdown when people are and confined to a small space, uh, there might be more risk of uh, friction and, and leading to violence. So yeah, that's the, yeah, that's the pattern that one can infer uh, from what's been going on. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have received a quite long question. I think it refers to, to Professor Heinz. So um, um, I will try to summarize this question a little bit. Um, um, the spectator says, uh, as a specialist in trauma therapy, I have heard quite a few of my more severely, severely traumatized patients react similarly to how Professor Heinz described OECD, OCD patients saying that they are partly are also relieved and that now they are not so alone with their constant feelings of anxiety, anxiety which, is also a, uh, which is also of relief to them. Um, also, many have been glad that keeping distance is now legitimate. Has any of you heard of similar reactions of people with severe post-traumatic post stress syndromes? Professor Heinz, maybe. Yeah, well, our feeling here is a bit mixed because some patients who um, have experienced going out in Germany, there wasn't a complete lockdown, going out alone and uh, in the night and feeling uh, threatened in rather lonely streets. Uh, it has been mixed, but generally what uh, this uh, person recommended or, or stated, I think is quite true. We have seen a lot of social support in the first weeks of the pandemic. And we had a feeling that this is helping a lot of patients to feel less isolated and that this general idea of taking care of each other that was quite widespread did actually help many patients with mental disorders. Um, I did not experience so much improvement in patients with severe PTSD, but this may be due to scare encounters in, in, in my personal uh, contacts with patients in these weeks. So there's a, I think a question that can be answered uh, by the panelists. What would the experts recommend for future lockdown regulations, taking into account the possible implications for mental health? Well, I mean, a lot of uh, the um, the um, contest of lockdown in in Africa, especially in Nigeria, anyway, uh, there was no provision for counselling for uh, responding to the consequence of the lockdown. Uh, even in the isolation, 
isolation centers and isolation wards and quarantine, these were done without uh, sufficient uh, attention to the mental health consequence of those, uh, of those uh, um, approaches. And I think in the, in, future, in the future, it will be very important to, to have uh, a more comprehensive approach uh, to delivering uh, whatever kind of service that we think is necessary as a res to, to respond to uh, uh, an infection of this nature. Uh, including when we, when, when we, if we need to do uh, to isolate people to put them in quarantine, that we shouldn't just think in terms of the physical limitation of space, but we should also think in terms of the consequence that might be associated with that. And of course, we've talked about the economic consequence of uh, of lockdown, and uh, especially in the context of uh, people not having uh, the, the not sufficient uh, formal palliative to cushion and the effect of the lockdown. And that's, that might be different in different, in, in, not, not the same in, in different countries, of course, but in countries where the resources are few and uh, people can really not afford not to have an income and the com government is unable to provide sufficient palliative. I think it's very important to uh, think comprehensively about how to do it in such a way that it probably should be as, as short term as possible and as limited as possible, apart from taking it, uh, to, to, into account uh, the, uh, the immediate uh, relief that people might need so that anger and frustration, domestic violence, use of substance and all of that can be brought under some control. Thank you. Um, Professor Rigel, we hand over to you and um, please continue yeah. with your moderation. Yeah, I want to thank all the panelists for all these yeah, dense and complex information. And as we have heard, uh, that it is very, very important for the mental health of everybody to have clear information, which is transparent to be able to allow to understand the uncertainties and the measure taken um, to fight it, even if there seem to be sometimes a little bit unjust. I want to thank the Asaf and the Leopoldina to provide this possibility to discuss in more depth the complexity of this pandemic. And I hope we will continue to do so for the best of um, yeah, of everybody, not only from mental health, physical health, and to help our um, politicians to um, find the right decisions and the people to stay healthy. Thank you very much.